Now, we all shop online, of course, and yes, we can't get enough of the convenience that it offers. Online shopping has gradually, gradually taken over in a way that we've all become accustomed to, of course. And taking us through more fascinating details, our next panelists will share their insights on the topic, the elevation of e-commerce, how online shaping will change the future. Please help me welcome our panelists, Mr. Bill Mower, Chief Marketing Officer at Intensity Analytics. That's right. Perfect. And I also have a Miss Ariana Lupai. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Uh, CEO, consultant at Aprodizio, and uh, Mr. Rich Tran, Chief Strategy Officer of Trish Hula Consulting LLC. I also have a Mr. Brandon Albelson, Digital Marketing Manager of Diotata.ceco. And last but not least, I also have Mr. Jake Ruttenberg, who is the CEO of GritPod Systems International. Now, they'll take us through this next discussion. They'll enlighten us on their secrets of behind e-commerce and its growing popularity. The stage is yours, guys. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for being here today. Uh, we're going to talk about e-commerce and how that's going to shape the future. I'm going to introduce myself first, and I'd like everyone uh, to introduce yourselves as well. Uh, my name is Ariana Lupi. Uh, I'm an SEO consultant and also the founder of Aprendo SEO. It's a platform to learn SEO in Spanish. And I'm here to talk about all things SEO and e-commerce, but I also want you guys to introduce yourself and let me know what you experience with e-commerce in general. Sure. Uh, so my name is Bill Mower, and I am the uh, chief marketing officer for Intensity Analytics. We're a company that uh, can tell you from how you type or how you interact with a computer. Um, and so we, we sell our, our software as a security solution, but it, it, uh, it can also do many other really interesting things. My background is uh, as a software engineer, I went to Carnegie Mellon University and uh, became a dot-com guy back in the day and me helped many, many uh, brick and mortar retailers uh, join the digital world and, and uh, built some pretty large uh, e-commerce sites uh, for a series of customers uh, throughout the, throughout the uh, North America and the world. Awesome, Rich? Uh, Rich Tran, I'm with Trishula Consulting. Uh, I serve the public sector, so I really haven't touched e-commerce per se, um, but I've worked with and for and consulted for systems integrators and helped them help the federal government digitally transform and modernize their processes and infrastructure. Um, my spin on e-commerce would be from that lens, and I'm leaning on Bill here to have this dialogue with me, so thank you, Bill, for having that common background. I'm Brandon Abelson. I work with Diodato.co. Uh, we're a growth marketing agency. I uh, focus predominantly on e-commerce and B2B advertising. We manage about $10 million a month in ad spend. Um, and yeah, I've been in e-commerce about three years now. But prior to this, I worked in political advertising. I did political campaigns and government entities. And let me tell you, e-commerce is way better. <laughs> Way better. <laughs> um, but yeah, Jake. My name is Jake Ruttenberg. Uh, I recently joined uh, the GripPod family. Uh, I've been in the defense sector for the past six years, uh, and I've come in to kind of take the task of bringing their company into the retail and e-commerce space. Uh, I've spent the past several months uh, working with all the large uh, brick and mortar, but also e-commerce retailers, uh, and connecting. Uh, our space from the military side, uh, bringing it into the civilian side and into the e-commerce uh, integrated platforms uh, to boost sales and um, happy to be here. Awesome. Thanks for sharing, guys. I, lo I love it. We all have like such different backgrounds. So the first question will be, how do you see right now online shopping is, how do you see how it has changed the retail industry in general? And how do you see consumer behavior is at the moment? Uh, I think I want to start with you and see how you saw like that, yeah, that transformation. Yeah, so I, I think there have been a couple different transforming events in, uh, in retail. You know, obviously the, the birth of the internet and 
you know, the Web 2.0 uh, phrase, you know, sort of digitally bound e-commerce uh, platforms to to engage with their customers in new and different ways, you know. And then more recently, I think the pandemic opened up, you know, both a dependence that our our, our country has on e-commerce retailers and and Amazon and 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 other uh, other other entities like that, but also restructured the relationship with the customers, you know. And so, you know. You know, we used to call it bricks and clicks, you know, but uh, really, you know, there are opportunities for the best of both worlds, you know, and retail, you know, uh, e-tailers like Amazon are even becoming retailers with their, with their uh, Amazon Fresh in the grocery store and they're redefining the rules there. You just walk out, you know, in the same way that uh, you, you walk out of, you know, any of these hotel rooms with the mini bar, uh, you know, and, and you, you get to pay $10 for a bottle of water, uh, you can do that in with Amazon. And so I think the rules around what's possible and the engagements that, that, uh, that customers want have, have dramatically uh, changed the world of, uh, of retail. 100%. I think the pandemic for definitely made everyone like change and adapt. Like it forced brick and mortar stores specifically to either have an online presence whatsoever, either like pickup or something similar. And also, for example, um, food deliveries, you know, all this brick and mortar did that as well. But yeah, definitely like it's, 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 it's before and after for e-commerce after that. I, I want to know what you guys think about, you know, how it's changed. So. I think we're in this kind of weird spot where we're coming out of the pandemic where everybody was shopping online. That's where we were all forced to. But now we're coming back, we can go out, we can go to stores. But that level of ease and convenience is just gonna be amplified with where we're going. So with VR and the ability to try things on from your house, Warby Parker does it where you can try your glasses on from your cell phone. You don't have to go to the store. It's just we're in this spot where we know it's coming fast, but how do we adapt? Because retail is going to go away. It's not going to be there in 20 years in the same sense that we know it now. And it just drives more for us as marketers to focus on that personalization for the user. So, go ahead. To that point, right, I think Bill said bricks and clicks. I like to say clicks and data. Mm. And every click gives you data about your consumer, about your market, about your demographics, right? And with all of that data, you can personalize every experience, whether it be online or in the store, with digital transformation, with digital augmentation in the store, right? You could have a digital experience in a store with personal catering, glass of wine. Absolutely, and yeah. that goes back to the platforms having that same data. Yeah, evolution. So we can look at it and say, hey, you're not just being targeted because you're in this demographic. You're being targeted because you've purchased this, this, and this, and we know you're going to also purchase this, on, and you have a higher intent. So data is pretty much going to control how we do everything going forward. For sure, on that topic, I was going to ask about targeting since, you know, it's so different the way we target, it can be different the way we target consumers on retail stores, you know, it's physical presence, sometimes people just walk by and see it. But when we talk about e-commerce or online, there's so many more opportunities to get people's attention and to let people know, you know, that we're here, that we're selling something. So how, how do you think we could manage? Um, or how's the best way to target consumers for e-commerce, or how, how do you think that's different? And on that, I want to talk also about attribution, since there's so many like marketing touch points on e-commerce nowadays. What do you think? Yeah, so I, I think that there are new ways of targeting customers that didn't exist before. You know, the cameras that are making sure that people aren't stealing product are also helping custom helping customers serve
people who are looking for something and not able to find it. And so I'll, I'll, tell, I'll tell an interesting story. You know, I, I live in the Washington, D.C. area, and uh, Gordon uh, 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 Peterson was a, an anchor on, uh, on one of the uh, networks there, and he ran a show called Inside Washington that was all political talking heads. And uh, I ran into him in Costco in, in Arlington, and he's in the adult diaper section of Costco. And I was about to go up and talk to him, but he was really looking at the product in a way that made me uncomfortable to reach up and, and talk to him. And, uh, but I kept watching him. It was close up to the cashiers and I was in line. And uh, eventually he found somebody at Costco, which is hard. <laughs> which is hard, yes. It, he, he, you know, his celebrity status might have had a little bit of help in him doing sure. that. But what he was looking for is, is diapers for babies. And they brought him to the diapers for babies section. And I said, oh, that, this can be a great story that I can tell someday in, you know, maybe in a conference. And uh, today, those sorts of eye in the sky behavioral things are things that, that physical retailers can do, you know, and the amount of places in stores where I see QR codes to see videos about the product that can merchandise it in ways that were unthinkably, uh, you know, complex 10 years ago. You know, everyone walks in to a retailer with a different expectation right now. You know, our grocery stores, you know, there are, there's Peapod by Giant, other, other ways in which you can order, you know, your groceries and have somebody shop for you, you know. For a segment of the population, that's great. I wouldn't want anyone touching my produce uh, in, in, any, in, any, in any way. I want to make sure that I'm picking out the biggest pepper I can for the, uh, if, peppers are, if peppers are sold each, I want to make sure I'm getting the biggest and best and freshest thing in the, in the world. I wouldn't do that, but I understand how, you know, uh, a, you know a, a mom or, a, or you know, a, a busy dad might want to trade off that pushing the, the grocery cart uh, idea, and they might trade it off, you know, to to uh, um, to the other 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 point you made to uh, to somebody to deliver it even to your house. And so I think we have a lot of opportunities for doing things very differently. And uh, you know, we're just rewriting these rewriting what had been slow moving rules at, at an in, insanely high pace right now. Yeah, I think that's definitely something that's depends on the person, you know. I, I, lo I love people getting, I, li I love ordering Amazon Fresh and getting my groceries. <laughs> so Bill, let me ask you a question just to pick it, pick it back off of that time, right? You, you're, you're speaking of specificity, right, of your product that you're choosing. So, so with the emergence of generative AI and, and this technology, and, and I'm just kind of brainstorming too and shooting out loud, do you think that one day this technology could be integrated into the e-commerce process such that, hey, I want X size of pepper at, at, at Y quantity, boom, ship it to me? I, I think so. I mean, I think, I think that uh, there, are certain, there are certain attributes of suggesting other, other items, you know, unconventional. You know, everyone knows in the summer, when you're going to buy the, the uh, marshmallows, you also want the graham crackers and the, and the yeah. Hershey bars close, close to it. And uh, I was speaking this morning uh, on the topic of uh, customer retention, and you know, one of the things were, what if you combine all of these different AI algorithms, right? You, you've got your customer segmentation and your product recommendation, and all of a sudden you have a, a generative AI engine on the back end feeding input to the consumer, right? And so the AIs are, teaching the AIs themselves, helping the consumer. And that's beneficial for the consumer right there because you're personalizing the experience for the customer. You're making a better user experience. And we do that by looking at purchasing habits, behavioral aspects, contextual targeting. 
And I think right now, if you look across the platforms on how we're able to target, we're not where we were even three years ago. Platforms like Facebook, Apple, Google, they're all pushing for automation. They want, Google wants you to use Performance Max, Facebook wants to just remove any behavioral targeting that you can each day, they're rolling something else back. Um, and what they're doing is they're looking at you and saying, oh, put your faith into us. We know our consumer, when in reality, they're really pushing to make the big dollars. <laughs> So where we come in, and it's going to take things like AI, and we heard yesterday speaking about chatbots and being able to be that voice of the brand, that's really where we're heading in terms of targeting is leaning on some of these other yeah. instrumentations like AI to get that result. Well, and then using that to, to make a, a brand in of itself, right? The personality behind the AI, you're gonna need that, right? Because otherwise consumers aren't gonna to relate to it. Yeah, absolutely, and we will run into those ethical questions like we did yesterday in terms of, well, if you're creating a persona through AI, is it really a person? Well, what is a person? It could, it could exactly. be biased as well. <laughs> I think there's a lot of room for it to be super biased if you're targeting through AI instead of you know real, real people. I want to ask Brandon how, how, how can you target, like how, how are the ways you target uh, people through e-commerce? So right now, we still optimize and use everything in our tool belt. So as long as behavioral interest groups are available on Facebook and Google, we're gonna use them. I, my opinion, your personal data is gonna give you more insights and give you a greater ability to increase your conversion rate than any interest group's gonna be. If you have a look-alike audience, say, of 1%, and you're testing that against maybe demographical data, even, say, 54 to 65, and it's your target market, that look-alike audience off of your purchase behavior is going to have a higher click-through rate. You're gonna see a better long-term value from your customer that you acquire through that. So it's that, and then on Google, when we look at it, you want to really move to the contextual targeting. So question for you. When, you. when you go down that rabbit hole, right, in attribution and demographics, I mean, there's so many variances and nuances, right? One, great, one, one age group of 50 to 64 is totally different from another from in a different region in America, right? So what are the kinds of correlations that are, you're looking at when, when, when you're going through this? What would you say, attribution? Attribution, targeting. Targeting. Target. Mm -hmm. So that's really understanding your funnel. Mm -hmm. So it's looking at that deeper attribution of the actual conversion. What are the touch points did it take to get to that actual conversion? And then how do I piece that together to understand which demographic out of that subset it is? Mm -hmm. So how do we look at the data that we pulled it's in? and clustering. It, we're building that persona and then we're building cohorts out of that persona. Yeah. I think okay. something I wanted to touch on was how con the consumer journey is changing. Like before, it was more like linear, like you saw something, maybe you saw an ad and then you converted. But nowadays there's so much, there's so much content, there's, there's so much like so many review sites, review like blogs, you, it's not like linear. You don't just see something and then you maybe consider it and then you buy it. There's more like back and forth, and the life cycle is so different. So, my like especially in SEO, you know, you might search for a specific keyword, but we usually see that some of the keywords are not necessarily like 100% ready to buy. There's tons of keywords that have a high intent, but that are not ready to buy yet, like reviews, best of, etc. So I think that's super challenging for marketers right now to understand. Okay. Where did that? Where did this conversion actually came from? Like, last click attribution came from SEO, but maybe they saw something on social media first, or maybe they saw a YouTube video first. So that like attribution is getting challenging, more challenging by by the day. How do you think that could help? We could help fix that. Yeah, yeah I, I I think that uh, the trick to all of this is. You know, instead of being able to say definitively, this is what caused this, I think we've got to have degrees of influence, you know, and we've got to start measuring 
people into whatever, you know, demographic or persona bundle they, they fall into, you know, and uh, there are lots of ways that marketers can get to, pe to people. I, I think we need to, we need to talk more about what the buying journey is for different products, you know, and, and you know, an, an easy one to talk about is, you know, 20 or 30 years ago, people used to go to the car dealer in their, in their hometown where their last car was bought. They'd go, if they were a Ford family, they'd go to the Ford, Ford dealer. If they, if they were a Chevy family, they'd go to the Chevy dealer. And, you know, consumer behavior and the information richness, you know, consumer reports and other, other sites drove, you know, I don't know when the last time each of you guys bought a car was, but I personally went to the dealer that had the exact car and exact color with the exact features I wanted, you know. Just to build off of that, I think in terms when we're looking at attribution, looking at that deeper funnel of the fact that it is omni-channel. You are seeing it online, you're seeing it on TV, and then you're going to the dealership already knowing what it is that you want in that vehicle. You're not showing up and saying, well, what features does this car have? You know what features the car has. You've seen it all and you've already been programmed to understand that. So yeah. understanding that funnel and your attribution to which one of those channels is actually getting the point across that you want to go to that dealership and buy that car. Well, and yeah. I think that leads into a perfect part where, you know, the car buying experience has never been the most incredible thing. You come into a lot, there's some cheesy salesman typically that's trying to hook you on something, <laughs> whether you really need it or don't. If you take that and look at more e-commerce driven stuff like luxury products such as an Apple computer, you know, the experience buying an Apple computer in the store is so incredible now. You walk in, they instantly have you with somebody, you get the computer, they spend all this money on the actual product itself, the unwrapping of it in the box. How do you take that and create an e-commerce experience? Because it's great if you land them one time, but if you can have a repeat customer because the experience online is so incredible, the packaging, the way it shows up to the door from the second they click on that website, you know, it's, it's the simple stuff. The, you put in your zip code and it automatically generates the city and the state and the country. The little things that make e-commerce better than maybe that experience of going to the store um, is something where, you know, I think there's going to be a lot of growth in, um, For sure. in the I near future. There's been many, like, um, different shopping experiences are, are now emerging. For example, like AR and VR, you know, you, you don't really, ha like you said, Warby Parker or Ryvan, you don't have to actually try on the glasses. I, I bought glasses myself without actually trying them on physically. And that's one part of it. Or for example, when you buy stuff at Target, Amazon, Etsy, like home, uh, home decor, etc., you don't have to like, you know how it looks. You can just test it with your phone. Uh, those, those are types of experiences that so, are changing. So to build on that, I want to ask the panel this, right? E-commerce plus product development. Imagine AR and you can generate content to see what kind of shoe you can design. Click, generate, manufacture, done. Yeah, and AI is going to help the whole logistics and warehousing because you're going to have automated robots running the warehouse and then AI-driven strategy that's running behind it and the people like Bill who know how to code <laughs> running the ship. Yeah, there's actually a study from Shopify I saw that when e-commerce integrate like AR or VR into their shopping experience, uh, conversion increases by 94%. So I think it's important to see how each type of store or industry can adapt to, to it. For example, like physical things are easier, but I haven't seen it yet, but maybe like try, try on, virtual try on clothes mm -hmm. or things like that. I think that's going to be probably the future. I don't know what you guys think. If you've seen any, any other trend around like the shopping experiences or merging as we were talking at the beginning, like physical and online experiences, for example. Um, like Target is a good example. I love shopping there. You buy it online, but I love going there, so I pick it up there, and I might go and shop for something else. But it's just like the experience is so nice that makes me want 
to do both. Or maybe if I'm in the store and they run out of something, I, I'll buy it online and I'll get home. But it's all like all so seamless in the app. So I don't know if you, what you guys, what's your experience, experience with like online experiences and hybrid experiences? I think it's all going to end up being that hybrid experience to even just fully remote as soon as they're able to actually put it into production at a large scale. I mean, 1% of the actual public knows that Web3 even exists. So yeah. you got to get people understanding these things before, it, the, before you get buy-in, but the ability to do it's already there. Yeah. And as a marketer, if you're not already putting together a strategy for that, you're already behind. Yeah, I, I'd, I'd add that I think that every brick and mortar retailer would benefit from creating a better experience for, for shoppers. And, and that's not just in how they position their products and, and how they merchandise them, but, uh, you know, there's a very large, uh, a very large luxury retailer that I did some consulting for that was talking about, you know, they, they were worried about how young people are buying clothes in different ways than their mothers and their grandmothers bought. And their, their retail in-store experience was mother and grandmother driven. You know, they're selling $400 <laughs> denim jeans and, uh, you know, but they're not selling them to people who are under 25. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, that retailer was examining doing things that are very successful in other cities like pop-up specialty retailers, but doing it under their roof where they get uh, those high-end fashion designers to run a, a pop-up store within a store, you know, and that might be the only thing they can do to get millennial consumers into something that they look at as, you know, their, their mother and their grandmother's uh, expensive clothing store. <laughs> and I'd say the best way that company would go about getting those consumers is starting that digital process. Yeah. And you're going to find them on Facebook. You're going to find them on non-brand search on Google. And then it's really on you as a marketer, as a company to nurture that lead because nothing substantial is going to come day of. It's always going to be multiple touch points to that actual conversion. Also, I think we have a responsibility as marketers to work directly with the like, product teams because it's not, you know, our job is not up to the point when they make purchase. It's also, you know, how's the overall experience. So if you buy something, you're getting, you know, how's the checkout process, which pay payment options we have. There has to be, you know, ease, like, make it easy for them and a good experience so they come back again. Uh, so for example, like, yeah, post-purchase post emails, SMS, or like, where's my package? Or, you know, where, where, where can I find it? That process also either helps or makes, makes it impossible and makes people don't, not want to go back to that experience. So I think there's tons of ways that we can improve the post-purchase post process, but I don't know what you guys, have you seen anything? I, I, I like getting emails, like makes me feel safe when I, I know where, that I can track what I bought, I especially it's if it's the high ticket. the transformation pipeline, right? You've got your IoT, your AR, VR platform, your e-commerce tracking, your data, you know, all that, right? Data analytics, uh, and potentially additive uh, uh, manufacturing. Yeah. Right? So, I mean, theoretically, all these technologies can weave in together and create value added into the supply chain. Um, it's just how much money you want to throw down. <laughs> Yeah, but well, I think that's, that's the thing super about important. digital. It's yeah. it, it comes it comes with a price. It, it, these platforms and it has leveled the playing field for so many people. And small retailers can compete and get their product out there. You no longer are held to a mom and pop shop in your neighborhood. You can buy stuff from Europe if you want at the click of a button. With so zero overhead. Exactly, and it. It's available, but at the end of the day, on these platforms and anybody you talk to from these platforms, 
It's about how much money you're putting into it where you're going to see return. And especially as you get more to this automated process of the platforms being the ones doing the targeting, it's going to take more money to, right. to play that game. Right. I think that ultimately when you get when you receive or get the, or send out the products, it's also important to get, you know, you're competing with so many people nowadays that you have to, the, the whole experience has to be amazing from the beginning once you land into a page or the website up to when you receive and open the package. You've seen like so many like, uh, what do you call it when you open up a package and you record it? Uh, unboxing. Unboxing, so unboxing videos. Uh, and it's, it's like just, makes a reference on how important it is to have a good experience even when you get the package. Uh, Amazon doesn't have to do it, they just throw your stuff in a huge box, but everyone else, like we, I've seen so many um, online stores that they just have a, such a nice experience and there's so many videos generated from the experience itself that makes people want to buy them. So I think that's also, you know, how, when you ultimately, ultimately get the product, it's important to have a good experience there as well. Yeah, no, I, I th it's, it's clear, that for high-end uh, electronics, Apple has set the bar uh, insanely high for that unboxing experience, and everyone else has followed suit. You know, when you buy a, like an Amazon device, you know, I'm I'm almost shocked with how well packaged it is and and how that experience is meant to be filmed. Uh, but you also have to look at, you know, where are we going with merchandising, you know, and if we're not, you know, if we don't have to stick things on pegs anymore, you know, and we don't have to wrap them in plastic, you know, Amazon lets their customers order stuff with a, with a, you know, highly recyclable, low, low environmental impact product. And that's what people are buying. That's many people are, are buying that experience as much as they're buying the high end, you know, I Apple think experience. It's relative to the product that you're selling. Yeah. Because I've worked with clients where that unboxing is what's going to change it them from a one time purchase to a subscription. Yeah. To that longer term value. And I, I have clients that are great. We could put it in a box, ship it out on Amazon, and call it a day but it's relative to that product. And especially when we look at how we're marketing, what the creative that we need to put out there, those unboxing videos, someone getting an unboxing and taking a video and putting it on YouTube that can go viral, that is gonna sell more products than sometimes the creative that you have teams putting together. So it's a compounding marketing effect. Exactly. And I think it also, you know, we're talking about Apple, we're talking about Amazon. This is also something that majorly impacts small business. So if you, like for us, for instance, you know, how I spent the last six months designing a new packaging that looks great on a shelf, but is also able to be shipped e-commerce. Right now, our product is in a packaging that every time it gets shipped, it gets dinged and busted up, and it doesn't affect the actual product, but the customer experience opening that box for the first time is looking at something that doesn't look great. It doesn't look appealing, and it doesn't have to be the billion-dollar engineered box that Apple comes out with that you, know, you perfectly open it up and it's this great thing, and it also doesn't have to be something that's 100% recyclable, but just the, the little bit, even in small business, that making sure your product is able to adjust with how the marketplace is growing and that you're gonna see, you know, you're gonna have more e-commerce sales than retail sales and making sure that you're not leaving either one of them behind. You don't wanna yeah. abandon retail and you don't wanna ab abandon e-commerce. You wanna make sure your product is evolving with the current trends to be a great experience no matter how the customer purchases it. Yeah, and that takes it back to that just omni-channel marketing. Right, we, we are hitting people at every level your brand voice needs to be in sync throughout every channel, and you really have to build that user experience. It, so, can you expand on that? So every channel meaning, so different social networks, right? For example, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, they're all gonna be different in tone. So it's not even just so much the social channels that you're looking at, but the copy I'm putting on Google okay. that I'm remarketing to the people that came to my site from Facebook Okay. And then that are getting those follow-up emails and those follow-up text messages. 
it, we need to be speaking in the same, same voice. voice. And it, it, if our email is saying something different than what our Google Ads is putting out, that it, it's dysfunctional. That user is going to think of seeing multiple ads, multiple different informational mm -hmm. pieces, instead of this is the product you want to buy, this is the product you want to buy, right. this is the product you want to buy. Right. In terms of, we were mentioning like channels, like marketing channels, will you have, I would say I have a favorite, I'm super biased because I do SEO, but what would you say, like if you're starting out in e-commerce, which channel do you think you can't you can miss? Or it's a, it's a mistake if you miss out on a specific channel for a specific industry? Probably Facebook. If you're a small business starting out, it's gonna give you the most volume. Um, if you're looking at a budget, Google Ads is always gonna be your number one search. Um, and then I think right now, if you have budgets in your clients, TikTok is probably one of the best places to be for e-commerce right now. It's a little hairy because we don't know if TikTok's even gonna be able to be used mm. at some point, but as long as it's there, if you're selling e-commerce, you need to be on TikTok. Yeah, I, I would say that uh, I think the richer the channel, you know, so video, people have been talking about video taking over, you know, and the reality is video has already taken over, you know, and, and so instead of, you know, Consumer Reports having a Kindle, the, the e-ink Kindle, the, the uh, you know, remarkable notebook and the, uh, and the um, you know, the iPad together, if you have a video of somebody showing you them side by side mm -hmm. and showing you the difference, that experience is something that is much more uh, earned and understood by the, by the consumers. And so people are looking for that, you know, and the smart uh, retailers are the ones who are promoting that content with ways of connecting that back to them. For sure, I think uh, two things like influencer marketing and user-generated content are, are also going to be huge because people are getting targeted in so many different ways that there's like the trust can be lost. Like you don't know who to trust. You don't trust the retailer that's selling you something. You might trust an influencer that you follow because of their values, because of their background. So I think it's going to be important to for retailers like e-commerce, like who do I trust? who has the same values as my, my company, my brand, and target consumers that way that doesn't seem as salesy, but more like, yeah, I, they do it every So day. I just heard social media, video, what about podcasts? And we're, 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 so now we're in the realm of content generation, and I want to touch on the topic. How does gener generative AI change e-commerce, right? How is it going to change everything we do in terms of marketing our goods and services? I'd say for e-commerce in terms of SEO, there's tons of ways you can use, you can use AI to you know optimize and automate uh, like titles, descriptions, mm -hmm. and work in bulk. Um, in that sense, yeah, like AI with SEO could be a good idea to start or keyword sure. research, etc. And I've I've seen Jennifer AIs creating videos and, and photographs. Yeah, and they can create campaigns. videos. They can create decks. Yeah. They, there's so much more that this can do that we don't even really know about. Right. Um, but it is going to change everything on how we do it. And it's right now we're in a spot where I don't advocate taking anything you get on ChatGPT and posting it into an ad in any way. <laughs> um, but as inspiration, as to write that content piece for SEO that you need to do, and then do a spot check on it, make sure everything's good. Sure. It, things that used to take you three hours to do, you could do in 25 minutes. Sure. So it's it, gonna create our ability to do things like dive deeper into the analytics of stuff. So I created that content piece. I now have two and a half hours left. I can dig into the analytics and big data that I pulled from my Or phone. now you can create a podcast version and a video version all at the same time using the same voice and tone, distribute it omni-channelly and be done with it. Exactly. And 
it just goes into efficiency. Right. Yeah, it, I, 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 think, I think the one area where I, I caution uh, any marketer in generative AI is that uh, there's a fine line between producing uh, content that will target a, you know, a specialty demographic and producing patronizing content sure. that will alienate that very same that very same audience and and you know uh, you know the shelves of retailers are stocked full of Bud Light right now because of a decision that that not the CMO, but a but a single marketer did with an influence marketer uh, that divided their and that goes back to know your audience. Yeah. Yeah. So whoever did that obviously did not take into account who their target market really is, or or, or they or they thought they or they thought that that uh, never the twain shall meet. Their their traditional consumers they thought we're not following this Instagram influencer, but when the media picked it up, all of a sudden it created a, a crisis in, 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 this, in, this, in this, this company. And, and as marketers, it's, it's, it is our job to know our consumers and to know the risk that you run with appealing to increasingly niche marketers and uh, well, niche, and, and I think quadruply so right, for e-commerce, right? Because our presence is global at the click of a button, right? And, and I think we just got to be cautious. Global. I agree. Yeah. I agree. One hundred percent. So many things uh, we discussed today. I could talk for hours about this, but in general, I think um, for e-commerce, like the future is. You know, knowing our customer and knowing where where they buy, understanding like the the life cycle and how they make decisions. It's not linear anymore. They have so many touch points, so we gotta be everywhere. Um, and then AI is also like super important part of it. Influencer marketing and consume and user generated content. Gotta be careful with it. It's important, but gotta be gotta be careful. Um, and then I want to open up the mic for questions. See anyone has any inside question for us? And I want to thank you guys for it because it was awesome, awesome. Um, do you think anyone's gonna come for Amazon? Are we bigger than them in 10 years? If so, no. <laughs> I, I'd say no, but I think Google Shopping wants to take part of it. And Google Shopping does. Um, I still think I can test that Google Shopping would have if they kept Smart Shopping. They probably would have built a bigger base of users. But Amazon is pretty much built like Google. So how you advertise on Amazon is exactly how you would on Google in terms of search intent and user intent. But they're just, until there's regulation of some sort on these larger companies, they control the game, and they're going to continue. Facebook's going to continue to control it. Google's going to continue to control it, and there's not going to be regulation put on them. So we have to take that into account and put on ourselves what ethics and what morals are we going to put out there when using these platforms. But I, I don't foresee anybody taking an Amazon down. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to uh, I'm going to take the opposite position on that. Because uh, you know Bar Barnes and Noble uh, was a was a great bookseller, and they had a fantastic website, uh, and they didn't see Amazon as a single threat to them. And uh, the reality is, we don't know what we don't know yet, you know. And I think the larger you are, the the harder you can fall, and whether it's through uh, regulation that uh, may that may uh, bring them down, and, and you know whether it's the antitrust regulation or whether it's just regulation to give everyone a fairer shot in this in this market. I think the stories that we hear about Amazon dominating diaper sales and driving, you know, driving uh, other competitors out of that business. 
are not going to reflect good on Amazon anymore, and we're not going to tolerate this. But you got to think about it from the perspective, not just like, okay, Amazon's my competitor here. They're selling the same product I am. You're competing with Amazon on Google search, yes. on every single one of your ads. Anything you search that you want to buy, chances are Amazon's going to rank number one. And that's because they can outspend you at every level. And they will. Um, so you're not just competing them for selling that product. You're competing with them for your CPCs, for your CPMs. It, they have control over things and people who have money have control over this market more so than others. Well, and to play a little devil's advocate to that, uh, obviously with technology, everything's sped up so much quicker. If you go back and look, you know, 20 years ago, like you're saying Barnes & Noble, Blockbuster, uh, no one ever thought that Netflix was going to overtake them. They had the opportunity to buy them, they didn't. As much as things change and as fast as they change now, you know, I'm not sure in 10 years if that's the, the threshold, but there's an opportunity that maybe gets blindsided. And I think, you know, it, it kind of happened with Amazon pretty quickly. It went from books to just about everything. And then all of a sudden it went to their own shipping service and their own logistics and all these things very quickly ramped up. And that's something that technology, AI, is all going to only make easier and quicker for competition. Yeah, let, let me, let me, let me move on, on telling a story about Blockbuster, because I've got a great one. Uh, in uh, January of 2000, I, I was flown down to uh, Blockbuster's headquarters in Texas and shown, given the opportunity to kiss the ring of the great man, John Antiaco, who ran Pepsi-Cola, and then he ran Blockbuster. Blockbuster was the, was the uncontested uh, powerhouse of all of media at, the, at that point. 95% of the US population lived within two miles of a Blockbuster store. And we came in there thinking we were going to talk to them about how we can make it easy for their customers to get a better experience with Blockbuster. They could, they could make sure the video that they wanted was at the store. They could return the, the video. Uh, they could extend the, the licensing. And you know what John Antiaco said when we suggested that he make it easier for his customers to extend the, uh, the rental? What? He said 75% of our profits are in late fees. Until you morons can figure out a way to make a customer lose the tape under their coffee table, I don't want to know anything about you. Yeah. John Antiaco is no one now. Wow. And anyone who thinks that th they're at the mountaintop, you know, and they're going to stay there is uh, is a Goliath that needs a simple David, you know, to come and, and take them down. And I've seen this story over and over and over again, you know, and it may be, it may be that it's going to take 10 Davids to take Amazon down, or maybe, maybe it's going to take 10 Davids to make, to make Amazon lose their focus. In, in, in whatever industry they're dominating, but it's going to happen, you know. It may not happen because Jeff Bezos built the company to not be toppled, and he's doing all of the great things you're talking about, you know, and his culture is still within that company. But it's really important to, uh, to know that we don't know where the next Amazon is coming from, and, uh, it could be coming from somebody in this room. You know, it could be coming from a good idea that some, uh, somebody who's, who's camping outside and, you know, you know, or touring the Grand Canyon, riding a, riding a burrow down there, you know, is, is having, having. And that's the great thing about this country. Well, thank you so much. I think we don't have any more time for questions, but I want to appreciate um, your time. And yeah, it's awesome. Let's see who's next, next Amazon then. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>